House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski, or Danielewski. I've heard it pronounced Danielewski, and it sounds kind of vaguely Polish or thereabouts with the ski in it, so I, I think the W makes a, a V sound. I don't know. Either way, House of Leaves. So this book was published in the year 2000 and was something of a literary sensation, and it has retained a very strong following ever since its debut. Now, of course, at that time, I was but a wee young thing, unable to appreciate this book when it came out, but now, to quote Val Kilmer in Tombstone, I'm in my prime. So, I read House of Leaves, finally, after years of hearing so much about it and hearing what a zany and kooky book it was, I got it under my belt. And this is the most unique reading experience I have ever had, bar none. Uh, there are some books that approximate certain portions of this book, but this book is in a league of its own. It is a thing unto itself. And you know what? I liked it. I, I did. I, I don't know that I would say I loved it, uh, but I definitely did like it. And more than that, I appreciated it. Um, originality is very hard to come by nowadays, and I think this is an example of something that was truly original. And so I can always respect that, even if I don't just drool over it. I've seen some people... Uh, on other reviews on YouTube and on like Goodreads who proclaim that House of Leaves is their favorite book. And I can really understand why, because this gives you, it gives you a puzzle that can never really be solved because there really is no solution. Um, so what is House of Leaves actually? And what is it about? Well, House of Leaves is a prime example in fact, dare I say it, it may be the most prominent example ever published of ergodic literature. Now, ergodic literature is a, a term that denotes literature that experiments in a very physical sense a, the way that books are narratively conveyed. That is to say, this book is an object that has to be manipulated to be digested in ways that pretty much any other book you're ever going to read do not. Uh, this book, the text in this book is crazy. It is insane. You have to rotate the book at several points to read it. Some things are written in reverse where you literally have to hold it up to a mirror to read it. Some things are encoded. Uh, it's, it's, it is a trip. That's all I can say. It is absolutely a trip. Um, but it makes sense mostly within the context of what the book is telling. So the story of House of Leaves, if you don't know, it is borderline, if not explicit, metafiction. But it's also, well, first of all, first things first, this is a prime example and, and, and a very extreme example of postmodern literature. And I will come back to that because I believe that this is postmodern literature taken to its logical extreme. Uh, but this is a postmodern work of ergodic literature. Uh, it's, again, borderline or perhaps all-out explicit metafiction, which concerns uh, the exploits of a young, basically kind of burnout loser type character in uh, L.A. named Johnny Truant. Uh, Johnny works at a tattoo parlor, and one day his friend Lude, you never know his real name, just Lude, um, tells him that an old man who lived in his apartment building died. So they go to his apartment, and they find a manuscript Detail, which is comprised of an exorbitant amount of commentary and references and notes pertaining to a film entitled The Navidson Record, or The Navidson Record. You think it's Navidson, but I think it's actually pronounced Navidson. Uh, but anyway, there's this film purportedly called The Navidson Record, which 
chronicles the strange and seemingly impossible occurrences inside the house of one Will Navidson, a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist who purchases a house in Virginia with his wife Karen and their, t or actually not his wife, his common law partner Karen and their two children. And then strange things begin to happen, sinister things begin to happen in their house. And doing what any good photojournalist would do, he proceeds to document it. And the old man, whose name in the book is Zampano, who died at, or be, before the beginning of the book, whose manuscript they are going through, wrote extensively about this film. And so what we have is a double story. We have a story and then we have a frame narrative. Johnny Truant's story is the frame narrative, which is told almost entirely through footnotes. Again, this is very reminiscent of like Infinite Jest, except that book used end notes, whereas this, well, this kind of has some end notes too, but it uses footnotes predominantly uh, with several different styles of font, as well as several different colors of ink um, to comment upon the commentary that Zampano, the old man, wrote about the film, the Navidson record, except hold on, hold the phone. We are told right up front within the first 40 or so pages that the Navidson record, the film that is the central object of this entire story is complete bullshit. It never existed. There is no Navidson record. There is no mysterious house in Virginia. All of this was made up, and yet we still get such extensive and exhaustive commentary on this. And at the end of the day, this book, as I said before, truly is a thing unto itself. So this book is also, if if I left this out uh, previously, this all this book is also a work of horror fiction, of a very unique sort. Um, and I've heard people say, I heard I've heard so many people say that this is like the scariest thing that they've ever read, uh, that it just it just gives you chills, and that it's it really just you know impacts you frightfully. Yes and no. Uh, there were certainly parts to this book uh, that were decidedly creepy, veering into the actual scary, but that wore off pretty quickly. Um, by the end of this book, fear was the last thing that this book was inspiring in me. Uh, but I can kind of understand why this book is is touted as such a good horror novel because it, it definitely it definitely does have a certain atmosphere to it an atmosphere of basically madness but it's not the scariest thing I've ever read by a long shot uh, but so at the heart of this book is a film a fictitious film called the Navidson record when which one fictitious uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist Will Navidson is documenting the impossible happenings in his house. Uh, his house is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, which is obviously a physical and mathematical impossibility. Um, and then the house, there are places in the house that should not exist. There are entire hallways and corridors where there should be nothing because it's just a, a blank wall on the other side of which is the outside of the house. So there should be no possible way that this could happen. But this house apparently does not obey the, the laws of Euclidean geometry. And so it is something of an extra dimensional, um, whatever, it's an ex, some kind of dimensional anomaly. Yes, an extra dimensional anomaly where impossible things happen and there are impossible spaces where there should not be spaces. And this book, I mean, the, the, the house is at its heart a labyrinth. As Will Navidson and some of his cohorts proceed to explore the house, they come to realize that it is truly a labyrinth. And that is reflected by the text of this book because that is what this book itself ultimately is, a labyrinth. 
and it is a labyrinth without any center. Um, so the so right out the gate, the book tells you that the central issue of this story, the Navidson record, the film that is supposedly so renowned and uh, written about and commented upon about this house that defies all laws of physics is made up. It's fictitious. It does not exist. And yet, an old man named Zampano wrote a crap ton of notes and commentary about this non-existent film. And beyond that, our frame narrator, Johnny Truant, wrote commentary and notes and references about that commentary. So at the heart of this book, there seems to be an absence of purpose, an absence of point, and that is the very purpose. That is the very point. This book confronts the reader with an absence of meaning because it is a labyrinth, as I said, without a center. And this, this is why I said that this book, I believe, is postmodernism taken to the nth degree, basically to its logical extreme. Now, I am not going to um, go off about what postmodernism is. I'm not qualified to talk about what postmodernism is. If you'd like to hear someone go on at length about postmodernism, you might could check Jordan Peterson's stuff because that seems to be one of his favorite boogeymen is postmodernisms and the, the postmodern uh, deconstructionists and whatnot. Um, postmodernism is a very broad term that it's basically an umbrella that uh, encompasses various cultural, artistic, and literary movements uh, with a kind of a unifying theme of questioning and kind of the deconstruction of traditional systems of value or authority as I'm given to understand it. And this, one of the hallmarks, I guess, of the postmodern age is the decline of concrete truths, uh, which are supplanted in turn by interpretation. We all know that favorite phrase among so many young people and millennials nowadays that says, well, my truth is this, my truth is this, you know, and it, truth used to be something that existed outside of people. Now it's something that each person um, basically creates, I suppose, as they go, or, you know, so we are supposed to believe. I don't know. I'm not going to comment about that. But one thing that is inherent about postmodernism is the decline of a external concrete truth and the supplanting thereby of interpretation. And this book is a perfect example of that in practice. There is no truth to this book. There is only interpretation. That is why I can understand why so many people love this book and why I really did like it because it gives you a puzzle that you can never solve. It's like that movie, that Christopher Nolan movie, Memento. At the end of that movie, the cop tells uh, Leonard, the main character, and he says, I gave you what you wanted most, or that he tells him that he created by taking, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. He takes the stuff out of his own file so that he will have a gap that he has to bridge because, as the cop says, what you want is a puzzle you can never solve. This book is that. There is no solution here. There is no meaning here. There is only interpretation. This is basically a litmus test of sorts upon which you can impress any number of interpretations. And it is really quite genius in that because what this book does is ultimately take the absence of meaning and make that thereby be the meaning. It's very loopy, it's very trippy, but it's also very smart. Um, and I really did love it. It's, it's, Again, it's so unique. It is the most unique and batshit crazy thing I've ever read, but I really did like it. Now, I will say this. It, there were some problems I had with it, and by the time I had, by the time I finished this book, by the time I finally completed it, it had worn out its welcome. I was growing a little tired of the tricks and the, the, the little stunts that it pulled. It was getting old. 
um, by the time I finished it. But beyond that, not all of the elements of this story are all that great. Uh, the the story of the Nabidson family as they document by through film their house doing all kinds of crazy crap uh, is by far the most interesting part of this book. Um, and it's the part that is acknowledged right up front to be non-existent. It is made up. It's fiction. But then again, the whole book is fiction. And it and as I, I didn't mention, this book is also an exceptionally great satire. This book has so many things. It's a horror story. It's postmodern. It's ergodic. It's a lot of things. But it's also a satire of academia because this book is so blatantly absurd in how much shit it brings to bear on something that does not matter ultimately. But through that, we also have to kind of question what our own academia in modern day is, because is that not like literary criticism? Is that not kind of like what I'm doing here? It's so meta. What I'm doing here, critiquing, analyzing, reviewing House of Leaves, does not ultimately matter. It doesn't. House of Leaves is a book that if you read it, it's cool. If you don't read it, you're going to live just the I mean, you're going to live regardless of whether you read this book or not. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And this book shows that in practice. It is such a blending of reality and fiction and the way that we in our modern day dedicate so much time and effort to things that just ultimately do not matter in the grand scheme of things. And that is the purpose yet again. We know that the books and the works of art that we analyze and bring our focus to bear upon and critique and pick apart, we know that those things ultimately don't matter, but they matter to us because they are something, they, they're they just something that we can, you know, give ourselves to, that we can pick apart endlessly because it, I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, you got to do something. And this book really just demonstrates how absurd, but how, yet how necessary that is. The the film at the heart of this, which is the book's central object, the Navidson record at the heart of this book, it, it openly admits does not exist. And yet it doesn't stop the characters in this, the outside characters in this book from dedicating so much crap to it. And it, at the end of the day, it, it is, it's just kind of, it's so satirical in how modern academia is. But I loved it because of that, because this book was not afraid to, you know, to poke fun at itself. Uh, because this was such a literary sensation and so many people are enamored of this book. And yet it's so kind of self-deprecating. It really is. You know, and I've seen people on Goodreads, the lower starred reviews on Goodreads of people saying, this book was the most pretentious thing I've ever read. He, you know, Danielewski had his head up his ass. It was just so just unbearable, the, the pretentiousness of it. That's the very point. This book is so intentionally pretentious that it's downright preposterous. Like, this book is the dumbest smart book I have ever read, or the smartest dumb book I have ever read. It is such a perfect fusion of fact and fiction and metafiction and stupidity and genius. It is, it's it's a really just a wonder. It is a marvel to behold because the, the level of dedication and ingenuity and knowledge because this is a very erudite novel as well just the level of everything that had to go in to make this is staggering uh this i this probably took years to write I, i'm sure i could look that up and find that out but I'm, I'm betting it took years to write but as i was saying coming back around to my critiques of it it's not perfect to me at least uh, because some of the elements of this story just are not strong enough to really stand on their own. Uh, the Navidson record, the, the part about the house is awesome. It really is, even though it goes off into so many 
uh, tangents and stuff that's just so boring. Uh, but it, at the heart of it, it really is interesting. And somehow the characters in the non-existent film are better than the actual uh, frame characters in this book. And that was the real weakness. The Johnny Truant story, which is the frame narrative of this book, is not that great. In fact, it's pretty weak. I had a lot of complaints about that aspect of the book uh, because, A, it's so repetitive. Uh, we come to learn towards the end of the book. I don't know if this is spoilers. I don't even know if you can spoil this book. But towards the end of the book, uh, we learn that Johnny's mother was, I guess, schizophrenic, had some kind of severe delusional, hallucinatory mental condition. And there is kind of implied that he may have inherited that because he's, he's going downhill so hard uh, since the start of this book. Because he the, the book opens and he gets the the manuscripts uh, f the old the dead old man Zampano's manuscript and he's going through it and then he becomes increasingly paranoid and terrified and he has panic attacks and he hallucinates um, and he keeps saying that the book is it's like it's absorbing his mind it's like possessing him kind of and you're like how. It's just kind of like how, but then at the end, it's implied. It's it's the most unreliable narrator I think I've ever seen, because uh, at the end, it's implied that he's actually severely mentally ill, and so that explains it. But his story was just so repetitive and pornographic too. I did not like that at all uh, because it felt like Danielewski didn't really know what to write to pad this thing out to be as long as it needed to be because the, the the story of the house and the the film that's really the meat of the book because that actually has a plot like that actually goes somewhere um but the frame narrative of johnny it interjected back into things just enough to remind you that it was there and it was really weak. It felt like there wasn't enough material to really bother with and so Danielewski just entered Inter inserted a bunch of s trivial crap in it and the again the pornography of it it's just it was kind of offensive in the way that it just women in that part of the story are nothing but sex objects just holes to be screwed like I'm sorry if that sounds crude but that's literally just the way they're used in that part of the book and I just didn't like that it was so thin it felt like there just wasn't really anything there and he was just writing crap just to fill space until we wrapped up I uh, didn't like that so this book does have some problems to it um, and uh, by the way speaking of the wrap up uh, it doesn't really it there is no real result well there is to the to the Navidson record part there is to there's a there's a great a really great resolution to the story within the story but as for the frame story there really is no resolution it just kind of stops and it, I mean that's okay I guess especially with this kind of thing you can do that because nothing is off limits in in this book uh, but it just kind of stopped, and it, then it went off into the appendices, because there are appendices, there are a glossary, I think, or something, uh, or in, uh, in index and stuff, there are photographs, everything, like every idea I think that Danielewski had went into this book, um, and mostly it came off good, but again, the frame story was really weak, I thought I did not like that much at all. It was mainly just, uh, it was mainly just the repetition of this guy saying, I'm cracking up, I'm cracking up, I'm losing it, and then just screwing his way through a number of nameless, faceless women that are just used as sex objects because that's how this book, that's how this book do, I guess. But um, uh, this book does have some kind of themes to it, and the main theme of this book, I think, is trauma. Uh, that's besides the postmodern commentary on nothingness and the lack of meaning or whatnot. Um, this book is at, at its heart, I think, about trauma and overcoming trauma, and that's why the ending to the Navidson record part of this book is really so great and so rewarding, and I really did like that. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, this book was an absolute trip. And I love how at the end, uh, at the end of whatever appendix you're in, when it just ceases kind of all writing, uh, it ends almost with a quote from the film Cool Hand Luke where it says, uh, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. Uh, because that's what that is this book's hand is nothing it is a confrontation with the complete absence of meaning or purpose and it really is kind of maddening it does foment an atmosphere of paranoia and claustrophobia and just insanity basically because this book is insane and again i really did like it but it's it got old after time, especially when you realize that there is no freaking rhyme or reason why you should have to be rotating this book to read it. It was just, it got a little try hard at the end. I was like, Daniel Evsky is just pulling crap out of his ass at this point just to try to make this book as, as uh, insane as he possibly can. And it did get old towards the end, but thankfully it didn't get, it didn't just drag on beyond endurance so there is that but uh this book is again the most unique thing i've ever read and i did like it even if i didn't love it so yeah oh and by the way the title of this book house of leaves uh that means i believe a book because the word leaf can also be used to refer to the pages of a book and this book is something of its own house of leaves and it is a labyrinthine house of leaves in which footnotes uh, are direct you, are in which footnotes direct you to other footnotes which direct you uh, to other footnotes from, uh, which circle back in an infinite loop and you can see why this book is so just kind of bewildering but also brilliant uh, but yeah, I think the word, I think the title House of Leaves actually means a book. Uh, but, you know, just throwing that out there. But anyway, to rate House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski, I'm going to give this a B minus. I really appreciated the ingenuity. I really appreciated how it was able to craft a meaning through the very lack of meaning, how it was so satirical and ridiculous but also kind of creepy in parts even though you know that what you're reading is not real like that's it's just so it's just so meta because it, you recognize that what you're reading is not real but then again what you read is never real i mean you, we read books all the time and we care very deeply about those books but they're never real and this book confronts you again with that knowledge and makes something really grandiose out of it Again, its tricks and little stunts did get old after a time, but the sheer balls on this thing, I got to tip my hat to. So, yeah, I would rate this as a B-. minus. I didn't like the borderline kind of misogyny of it, or at least of one part of it. I didn't like how thin some elements of the story were. And I think maybe this could have been shorter. There were also footnotes that served no real purpose that were just there because every page had to have a footnote it was like we can't go one page without a footnote so i'm just going to insert some stuff here because this is a postmodern ergodic work damn it and we're going to make sure that people are as confused and bewildered as possible uh but you know i do have my gripes with it but overall it was more fun than i thought it was going to be i didn't really know what to expect going in but i actually enjoyed myself pretty much with it i respect this work if not adore it but yeah it's a good book i could recommend this if you're into something very unique and something that's unlike anything you've probably ever read or probably ever will read um and i totally understand the the adulation that this book gets i think it is probably pretty well warranted so yeah house of leaves by mark z danielewski have you read house of leaves if you have let me know down in the comments what you thought about it whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything that i've said about it here today and if you have not read house of leaves uh i could like as i just said i could recommend this although i will say this this is probably one, this is definitely one of the most expensive paperback books i've ever bought it was like 
almost $25. You can only buy this book, I think, in trade paperback. This is not something that translates well to like an e-reader or a Kindle or anything. Um, this book was designed explicitly for one specific format, um, but it's kind of pricey actually because this book, there was so much, the the requirements to even make this book exceed basically any other book. So I can understand why it costs more, but still it's a little pricey. So take that into account. But if you're into something that's just so wildly unique and just kind of such a thing unto itself, check out House of Leaves because it will take you for a ride to nowhere, but you're going to enjoy that ride while you're on it. So, and as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to like, subscribe, help the channel out a little bit. I would really appreciate it. And until next time, peace.